Breaking tonight, CBC News reveals new details on what led the Prime Minister to accuse India. What Canada knows, where the intelligence came from, and what happened behind closed doors. Plus, Canadians caught in the middle as India suspends visa services. We are the ones who are going to suffer, not the diplomats. And that issue breaks down a high-stakes diplomatic showdown. Ontario's Premier bows to pressure and reverses a plan to develop protected land. I made a promise to you that I wouldn't touch the green belt. I broke that promise. And as Alberta eyes its own pension plan, the rest of Canada may have to pay up. Albertans have been paying much more into it than they've gotten back. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. CBC News has uncovered new information about what the Canadian government knows that led to that shocking statement this week. Sources confirmed to us that Ottawa has evidence linking Indian diplomats in this country to the killing of a Sikh leader in B.C. Also new tonight, what we can reveal about the timeline of this diplomatic crisis. Sources say these accusations were brought to India's attention well before a tense meeting between Justin Trudeau and Narendra Modi at the G20 summit. Evan Dyer is breaking this news for us tonight about the intelligence and how this has all played out behind closed doors. Bonjour tout le monde. Days after a shocking accusation, the Prime Minister insisted he did it with good reason. But I can assure you, the decision to uh, share these allegations on the floor of the House of Commons Monday morning was not done lightly. And now CBC News has learned from senior government sources that when he stood in the House, Trudeau had both human and signals intelligence that showed the involvement of Indian government officials in the murder of a Sikh leader in Surrey, B.C. back in June. Hardeep Singh Nijar was a prominent member of a separatist movement labelled a terrorist by India. Some of the intelligence from intercepted signals includes communications from Indian diplomats present in Canada. But it wasn't all gathered by Canada's own spy agency. Some of it came from a Five Eyes ally, a group that also includes Australia, New Zealand, the UK and the US. One of those allies has been more forward in its support for Canada than any other, the United States. I have seen in the press some efforts to try to drive a wedge between the United States and Canada on this issue, and I firmly reject the idea that there is a wedge between the US and Canada. The US is trying to draw India into a closer security relationship, but Sullivan said today that India has to be accountable. We will stand up and defend our basic principles, and we will also consult closely with allies like Canada uh, as they pursue their law enforcement and diplomatic process. As that transpires, India is applying more pressure on Canada as it stops issuing visas for Canadians hoping to visit, accusing Trudeau's government of providing a safe haven for terrorists. The reason is that we have seen Canadian diplomatic interference in our internal affairs. Government sources say Canada is weighing a response to the visa suspension, but has made no decision yet. Interestingly, Evan, it looks like India is making an effort to get the U.S. on its side, inviting Joe Biden to be the guest of honor at India's Republic Day. Right, and Joe Biden has not yet accepted that invitation, but the Financial Times is reporting that Biden did raise the Niger murder with Modi directly when he met with him in New Delhi. And as for the communications from Canadian officials, we can report also that there were several efforts to talk to them before Prime Minister Trudeau traveled to India and met with Modi at the G20. Canada's National Security Advisor Jody Thomas went there for four days in August and then again a couple of days before the G20, before that Modi-Trudeau meeting. And Canadian government sources are telling us that whatever the Indians are saying in public, in those private meetings, they have not denied these allegations. All right, Evan Dyer in Ottawa. Now, that political rift and the suspension of visa services is having very real consequences for people in this country. As Lindsay Duncombe shows us, many hoping to travel to India just had their plans turned upside down. This is not what Santosh Sandhu expected when she bought tickets to India for October. She's still waiting for her visa. But now that's in jeopardy. The government of India suddenly declared visa processing is suspended, officially due to security concerns at offices like this. But Sandhu blames prime ministers, two of them. India's Modi and Canada's Trudeau have left us all distraught, she says. 
The visa decision follows Indian outrage after Canada accused the country of being involved in the murder of Hardeep Singh Nijjar, a Sikh separatist India considered a terrorist. We are the ones who are going to suffer and not the diplomats. Myself and my Manbir Singh is worried he might not make a family family wedding. wedding. There's a panic right now in in the city that everybody might not be able to go. In 2021, 80,000 Canadian tourists visited India. Late fall is an especially busy time due to warm weather, festivals and weddings. Maitri Bat is also worried about missing a wedding, her own, on October 26th. We have planned a three-day event and we have booked our venues. We have like wonders all paid for. Honestly, don't know anymore. Like everything's just shattered. Like I just feel like the ground just shattered underneath me. The same timing. This travel agency doesn't have all the answers its customers are looking for. Will planes fly? Will Canadians be safe? We cannot give the answer. We are saying just calm down, stay calm. One can only hope that uh, there is a successful resolution to this. And I won't call it a spat. I'll, I'll call it a crisis. This is quite unprecedented. A crisis that just went from being geopolitical to incredibly personal for so many. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Surrey. As this story develops in Canada, reaction has been swift in India. South Asia correspondent Salima Shibji is in our Mumbai bureau. So Salima, can you give us a sense of how the Indian government is explaining this escalation? Well, the Indian government keeps repeating several things, that Canada is a safe haven for what India deems terrorist activity and that all of this is politically motivated. That was the theme of a 45-minute press briefing from India's external affairs ministry today, the accusation that Canada is sheltering terrorists. The words safe haven and Canada came up repeatedly in that briefing seven times. India has always seen Canada as lax in dealing with the Khalistani movement, but that view is just intensifying as relations between the two countries Uh, hit an all-time low. And what about the messaging you're seeing in the various media outlets? Well, India's boisterous TV news landscape is really firmly aligned with the government's view. There's near universal criticism of Canada's prime minister. Uh, Many commentators do see Justin Trudeau as uh, pandering and going with these allegations to win votes in the Sikh community in Canada. As for the people on the streets, uh, many people do echo that view as well. There's almost a, a sense of disappointment in Trudeau and in Canada that they came out with these allegations without evidence to go along with them. And there are also is a little bit of anxiety amongst the people here, worried about how far this will go, whether Canada will uh, look at visas, and as the tensions really get worse between those two countries. All right, Salima Shibji in Mumbai. The political fallout is far from over. In about 20 minutes, Rosie and the Ad Issue panel will join us to break down the state of Canada's relationship with India now and where it could be heading. They will also tackle a new twist tonight in a political scandal unfolding in Ontario. Premier Doug Ford says he is reversing his government's decision to allow developers to build housing on environmentally protected land. As Illa Musa explains, it comes after months of pressure. It was a major mea culpa. I made a promise to you that I wouldn't touch the green belt. I broke that promise. And for that, I am very, very sorry. Ontario Premier Doug Ford now says opening up parts of protected land in Ontario for housing development was wrong. It was a mistake to open the green belt. It was a mistake to establish a process that moved too fast. It's an admission that echoes two scathing independent reports that found the process favored a small group of well-connected developers that stood to gain billions. It never should have taken a series of scandals from this government for the premier to undo the damage that he's done. What followed were a string of high-profile resignations that included the housing minister's chief of staff, the housing minister himself, a second cabinet minister, and Ford's director of housing policy. What do we want? Green Bell! For those who fought hard against the move, this reversal is a victory. It's a great day for the people of Ontario. You know, we've had tens of thousands of people trying to make this day happen, and uh, finally it's, it's, it's come to pass. 
At a caucus retreat, Ford says he heard about the concerns of voters. Opinion polls released earlier this month show approval for the premier and his party has fallen. The reality remains that there's still a variety of other mistakes that he still needs to rectify to both address the housing crisis in Ontario, but also to restore faith in his government. Really excited Ford says he's confident nothing criminal took place. The RCMP continues to look into the matter, but has yet to determine whether it will launch an investigation. Idlemousa, CBC News, Toronto. Alberta's government is pitching a major move that could affect the entire country, pulling the province out of the Canada Pension Plan, along with hundreds of billions of dollars. Julia Wong lays out this vision for an Alberta Pension Plan and the math that some say doesn't add up. Danielle Smith is making the case for a provincial pension plan, saying the federal one is not fair for Albertans. Albertans have been paying much more into it than they've gotten back during that same time. According to a new report commissioned by the province, an Alberta pension plan would save people up to about $1,400 a year and still give them the same benefits. It says Alberta is entitled to withdraw $334 billion from the Canada pension plan. That's more than half its total assets. Not everyone agrees with the math. And so it's invented. It's basically invented. The percentage of contributions from Alberta is closer to around 16%. And that's just a fairly unreasonable number and I think a problematic interpretation of the act itself. Smith says if Alberta goes it alone, it would mean Canadians outside the province and outside Quebec, which has its own plan, would need to contribute $175 more a year. Experts say it's hard to pin down that cost. But what that means for the rest of seniors is that it's either going to mean cuts in their benefits or higher contributions for workers uh, across Canada to make up for those shortfalls. Ottawa is paying attention. It's going to be important for me as finance minister and finance officials to study that position carefully. I'm going to also want to speak with the finance ministers of other provinces. But there's another issue, says this political scientist. The problem for the Alberta government is the majority of Albertans consistently say they don't want this. And on the streets, we found mixed reaction. It would be a great idea for anything that could be done local in province um, to be taken care of here and keep the feds out of it. This government is all about trying to isolate Albertans rather than to be part of Canada. The province says no decision will be made without a referendum. And that won't happen until after a report from a panel consulting with Albertans is submitted in May of 2024. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Now to some breaking news out of Ottawa. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and the First Lady touched down in Ottawa tonight. This is his first visit to Canada since Russia's full-scale invasion began. He was met on the tarmac by the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, and both Canada's ambassador to Ukraine and Ukraine's ambassador to Canada. Ashley Burke is also there. So, Ashley, that's quite a welcome. Adrian, I have never seen a motorcade that long to greet a uh, visiting world leader at an airport. I counted 20 vehicles and that welcome that you saw, I think that shows how significant this trip is here in Canada. The last time that President Zelensky addressed Parliament, it was from a bunker just a couple weeks after Russia invaded Ukraine. Now, 18 months later, he's here in person. He's going to be addressing MPs in the House of Commons tomorrow, uh, physically in person. And, you know, as well, he's going to be meeting one-on-one -on -one with Trudeau. He's going to be sitting down with the Governor General and traveling to Toronto to meet with business leaders. And it's a chance for him to make his case for continued support. It comes at a time when Ukraine's counteroffensive is, counter is moving slow. And, you know, there's not a, a, a quick end to this war in sight. You've got Poland saying that they are going to be uh, stopping providing weapons. You've got some division in the U.S. among the Republican Party. So we're expecting that Zelensky is going to be asking for more military equipment, including armored vehicles and tanks. Yeah, no doubt. So a significant visit, uh, not just for the two leaders. This clearly matters for a lot of Ukrainians, both abroad and here in Canada. Now, Adrian, Ukrainians who fled and came here and sought refuge say that seeing their president here on Canadian soil, that it gives them hope. 
that they are going to one day be able to go back to Ukraine. Tonight, the prime minister also released a statement saying that Canada's uh, support is unwavering and that they will continue for as long as they have to. All right, Ashley Burke at the, at the airport in Ottawa. So Zelensky arrived here after spending the day in Washington, and as Katie Simpson tells us, he showed up with an urgent message for American lawmakers. There is little daylight between these leaders. U.S. President Joe Biden, the most important ally of Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, welcoming him for his second wartime visit. Mr. President, we're, uh, we're with you and we're staying with you. The White House remains all in, announcing another $325 million aid package with additional air defense capabilities. For Ukraine, a very powerful package. Thank you so much. And it has exactly what our soldiers need now. But the solidarity on display here is not shared in Congress, where there is growing resistance among some Republicans. I think it's irresponsible to think about their country before I think about my country. President Zelensky, what's your message to Congress? Zelensky tried to win over his critics on Capitol Hill. In closed-door meetings, he bluntly urged lawmakers to pass Biden's previously announced $24 billion support package. Mr. Zelensky said, if we don't get the aid, we will lose the war. That's a quote from him. The direct appeal did not appear to change critics' minds. We're going to spend another $100 billion? For, for what? Meanwhile, uh, our southern border is in a state of collapse. Cracks in support are also emerging closer to home. Poland's prime minister declared no new weapons will be sent to Ukraine. The escalation of a grain dispute with its next-door neighbor. All of this happening as Russia intensifies its attacks, targeting civilians in deadly rocket strikes, the worst in more than a month. While the vast majority of U.S. lawmakers support funding Ukraine, the resistance is coming from a powerful corner. The far-right Republicans who helped Kevin McCarthy become speaker and have tremendous influence as a result. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. One of the world's most powerful figures in media, 92-year-old Rupert Murdoch, is stepping down as head of his vast empire. Murdoch spent decades buying newspapers and television stations around the world, gaining political clout and courting scandal. In a defamation suit this year, Fox News Channel, a jewel in his crown, paid the equivalent of a billion dollars for false claims about the 2020 U.S. presidential election. Murdoch hands the reins to his son, Lachlan. We're getting new insight tonight into the mindset of a man accused in the killing of a Muslim family in 2021. I'm really shocked um, to hear something so straightforward, someone so aware. The newly released video of his confession, next. Also ahead tonight, taking Indigenous businesses to the next level. Indigenous entrepreneurs remain one of the fastest growing demographics of entrepreneurs in Canada. A grassroots movement looks to share what's working and what isn't. And later, a family separated by war back together again. <laughs> the emotional reunion six years in the making. We're back in two years. There's a lot of families that need some love tonight. And we extend that from 20 million New Yorkers. There's been a deadly crash in New York State. A charter bus carrying high school students to a band camp flew off a highway and rolled down an embankment, killing at least two adults. Several other people are seriously injured. It was in a convoy of buses traveling together. The governor says an issue with a front tire may have played a part. An Ontario court has released video of an accused terrorist confession. The jury heard Nathaniel Veltman says he targeted a Muslim family because of their faith. As Thomas Daigle shows us, those jurors will have to decide how much weight to give those words. At Nathaniel Veltman's trial, the jury was shown video of a police detective leading him into an interview room where the accused terrorist laid out why he used his truck as a weapon. I want the world to know why I did what I did, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell you. Veltman was taken to London police headquarters after his arrest. Then he was searched and booked, wearing a T-shirt with a cross, meant as a reference to religious wars between Christians and Muslims. 
Officers also seized the helmet and bulletproof vest the man wore when he was arrested. The deadly attack on the Ufzal family, he said, was 100% politically motivated. It was terrorism. I'm not, so, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna like. I'm not gonna try to get a lighter sentence by saying it was just murder, not terrorism. In the video shown in court, then 20-year-old Veltman described himself as a ticking time bomb, an avowed white nationalist who consumed far-right conspiracy theories and spent three months in his London apartment planning to kill Muslims. I'm really shocked um, to hear something so straightforward, someone so aware and so and so assured about what they were doing and why. Detective Micah Bordeaux testified about interviewing Veltman twice in the hours after the killing. The second time, Veltman appeared reluctant to answer. At this, uh, <clears throat> at this current time, I don't wish to speak on the, <clears throat> the attack that I did. His lawyers suggested in court investigators took advantage of Veltman, making him confess late at night, giving him only a concrete block to sleep on behind bars. The judge said it will be up to the jury to decide whether to consider Veltman's confession credible. The trial continues in Windsor with proceedings shown on screen for the community here in London. The accused has pleaded not guilty. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London, Ontario. From the fallout over the India allegations to Doug Ford's Greenbelt walk back, there's a lot to talk about in politics tonight. It was a mistake to open the Greenbelt. Rosie and the ad issue panel will be here to break it down. Plus, Indigenous business owners share some success stories. Until we're at the point where we see more Indigenous faces on all aspects, on all businesses, then uh, we haven't reached our goal yet. The challenges they say they are still facing. That's coming up next. I feel good about it and I'm in peace with it. I think it's the right time to officially say that I'm not going to play football anymore. Quebec NFLer and Dr. Laurent Duvernay-Tardif is calling his football career quits. He played in eight NFL seasons while also completing his medical degree. And he grabbed headlines when he opted out of the game in the early days of the pandemic to volunteer at a Quebec long-term care facility. Medicine and his foundation will now be his focus. And the focus at a meeting of more than a thousand Indigenous entrepreneurs today sharing ideas on how to take their businesses to the next level. Nisha Patel shows us how one grassroots initiative is aimed at doing just that. Indigenous entrepreneurs from across the country connected, networked and shared knowledge. Trending colors for next spring. Trisha Petura says support like this is essential when building a business. A lot of entrepreneurs are alone and and then to do all the tasks and wear all the hats, it's almost impossible. Yeah. Petura is from Nipissing First Nation. She co-founded Mini TP, which makes shawls, bags and blankets. It was one of five Indigenous companies named to the first SOAR accelerator. The program aims to help boost revenues and turn these companies into big name brands. To have access uh, to one-on-one -on -one meetings with buyers, you know, and having some executive uh, uh, mentorship that will have impact on our growth. Out of all private sector companies in Canada, Indigenous-owned businesses make up less than 2%. People tend to invest in companies that are like them and in founders that are like them. This business professor says the venture capital industry isn't diverse enough, so accessing funding is a huge hurdle, but he's optimistic. Indigenous entrepreneurs remain one of the fastest growing demographics of entrepreneurs in Canada. We've always been a part of trade. Sunshine Tenasco co-created Source Programs. It's being able to be seen and knowing that your voice matters. She hopes the initiative will inspire others. Until we're at the point where we see more Indigenous faces on all aspects, on all businesses, on shelves, on, you know, in the mainstream, then uh, we haven't reached our goal yet. Okay. That's the plan for Petura, who now wants to take her goods global. It's like my kids see that, you know, whatever you want to do, you can do it. And if you dream big, like there's nothing holding you back. It's the kind of economic empowerment that could last for generations. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto.
All right, it's time to break down the news shaping our world. It's Thursday. Rosie's here with that issue. At issue this week, an explosive allegation directly from the Prime Minister. Today I'm rising to inform the House of an extremely serious matter. That there are credible reasons to believe the government of India was involved in the killing of a pro Palestine Canadian activist. The decision to uh, share these allegations was not done lightly. Justin Trudeau is calling for India to take the matter seriously. India says the allegations are absurd. No specific information has been shared by Canada. Now it's suspended visa services for Canada. So what might happen to this important relationship? I'm Rosemary Barton. To break it down on an issue this week, Chantelle Bear, Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. Good to see everybody this week. Andrew, why don't I start with you? There, there you know, it, it was an extraordinary moment when the Prime Minister rose to, to, to say that inside the House of Commons. Uh, Evan Dyer broke some news uh, tonight about the nature of some of the intelligence that was uh, gathered and shared. What, what do you think of how the government has handled this in terms of why they made this public and then how they've explained it since? Well, I think they were put in a, in a tough spot because, frankly, the Globe and Mail broke the story. Uh, it wasn't the Prime Minister who told the world that uh, Canadian intelligence uh, suspected India of involvement in this killing. It was a Globe story. And after that, I suppose you could pretend that the Prime Minister could just say no comment, but I don't think you could with something as scalding as the murder of a Canadian citizen, alleged or otherwise. So uh, uh, I think he had to. Uh, obviously, people will say, well, why don't you talk to the I Indians uh, privately? Well, they did over the mm -hmm. summer. Yeah. Uh, apparently got nowhere. Well, why didn't you consult with our allies? Well, they did consult with our allies. And in fact, Evan Dyer's uh, reporting suggests that uh, some of the intelligence for this may have come from, from, from our allies. Yeah. So I'm not sure what else he should, he should have done. People are sort of going off and saying, well, almost as if he made it all up on the spot just for political advantage in some way. Uh, you can think whatever you like about uh, Justin Trudeau. I don't think anybody is that dumb that they would go off with no information. You don't get up and make a claim like that unless you have pretty darn solid information behind it. Chantal. This is a government that uh, just a year ago came out with a new strategy to try to take some distance from China. And much of that strategy was based on more engagement with India. Mm -hmm. The Prime Minister knows this. As a result of his government, he's not unaware that by standing up in the House of Commons, he is basically throwing out that strategy, but also uh, buying some fairly tough times uh, in the Canada-India relationship. Yeah. This is not something you do on a Monday afternoon when the House comes back because you've just looked at the last poll and said, yeah, I'm not doing so well. Maybe I should just uh, throw a fire between Canada and India yeah. and see yeah. if that helps me. Now, what today's report tells me, and it comes from government sources, is that there is a sense inside the government that uh, while the prime minister should not and cannot be coming out and to have a news conference to say this is our evidence, mm -hmm. uh, that there is merit in providing more substance to the prime minister's statement. Yep. Uh, and that substance is interesting, especially when you look at the um, Indian official reaction, no evidence was presented to us. Your story says uh, Justin Trudeau's national security advisor has spent five days recently in India. Yeah. I'm sure she was not on a junket. No. Uh, no. And, and I'm sure she didn't show up there empty-handed saying she'd heard a rumor <laughs> while she was shopping uh, <laughs> that something bad had happened. So, so yeah. uh, objectively, I think the government has handled this at best it could, knowing that the story was going to be coming out within minutes actually minutes before the prime minister stood up. And, and I think that that's a really important point that Chantal makes about the Indo-Pacific strategy, Althea, because it, it, it was supposed to be sort of the, the cornerstone of what the government was going to start doing in that region. And to throw something on top, you know, to, to light a, f a flame on top of it and say, well, we're going to have to readjust, that wouldn't be done lightly. And I, and I don't know how they're going to readjust, to be clear. I know. I think you're absolutely right. Um, it wouldn't be done lightly. Um, and they obviously had to anticipate what the consequences would be. And I don't think that we have gone through the full scenario of what those consequences no. would be. It's obviously going to get far worse before it gets better. But if I can just go back to the initial question that you posed, Please. Andrew, which is what led to this. Um, my colleague, Susan Delacourt, wrote about this earlier this week. But from the government's thinking, 
there were reporters, and I understand that, uh, that's probably Evan Dyer, who was working on this for a very long time. And then the Globe and Mail got wind of this, and uh, Bob Fife uh, said on the air that he had given the government 24 hours. So I think two things were really at play. They didn't want the media to be driving the narrative. And the second thing that Susan Delacour reported was that they felt that they were behind the eight ball in the spring on the China allegations, sure, that they were, sure. their hands were behind their back, basically, that they couldn't respond because intelligence and the bureaucrats were telling them, uh, you, you can't go beyond this. You, you cannot explain everything that you know. And there was a frustration there. And mm -hmm. so they felt that it would be better uh, from a new communication standpoint to be more transparent with the public and to be able to drive the narrative themselves. And that's clearly a decision that they have made. But to Chantez's point, and I think we all agree, if you don't come out there with um, words that are vague without anything to back it up. And I think, yeah. um, you know, there, we obviously, I think, are probably a bit more informed about how government works than, you know, my mother at home. Sorry, mom. Um, but <laughs> but I, I think there's like a disjointedness where you see the prime minister come out and use words like credible allegations of a potential link. And they seem yeah. like they're casting a lot of doubt. Yeah. But I think we have to remember that there is this criminal investigation and a lot of the intelligence that the government is relying on cannot see the light of day in a criminal probe. So it's possible sure. it doesn't actually end up with anything. Yeah. And so in some ways, the government kind of has to dance this really delicate balance. Andrew, in terms of the geopolitics, you know, obviously allies are not responding um, in the same way they would have about China, for instance. How difficult is it for the government to uh, maneuver through all of that then? Well, there, yes, there, there is a, a strategic concern that India is seen as a bulwark or a counterweight against China. Um, now, you know, the, the further in India slides towards authoritarianism, the harder it is to tell the difference, but obviously there's still a, a substantial difference between them. Uh, but it's, it's a concern not only for Canada, but for our, our, our partners. Yep. But they're also not going to get out in front. You know, the Prime Minister's statement in Parliament didn't directly accuse the Modi government of of literally killing this person. No, no. Uh, uh, he, he left wiggle room, and I think maybe part of it was to give the Indian government some room for plausible deniability. In other words, to make the point, uh, don't do this again, we know what you're up to, but to try to keep, uh, give, leave some strategic, strategic room to try to keep in, uh, India somewhere on side. Uh, now, the Modi government has not taken that hint and instead has reacted in about as uh, defensive a way as you possibly could, not really the sound of a, of a government that has nothing to hide. Yeah. You know, if it, if it were truly innocent of all involvement in this, it would say, we join the Canadian government in deploring this killing and we will work with it to bring whoever was responsible to justice. Instead, we had all this bluster and accusations that, that Canada is providing safe haven for terrorists. Yeah, so yeah. that's not the response you would expect from a, from a, a, a government that had nothing so to So that is something that, that the Modi government has said to this government many times, because they, they, they do believe that that's what's happening to some extent. Um, Chantal. Yes, but uh, then we would need to go further into the weeds of uh, the kind of nationalism that is okay. uh, the, the feature of the current government of India and what yes. it has mean, meant for the diaspora on, on all sides of this issue uh, that are feeling those tensions uh, yeah. and, and that, that we are now witnessing mm -hmm. um, via remote. But, um, I would say that uh, allies are not going to step up and say we're all going to trash our corners, the cornerstone stone of our strategy to move away from China. But at the same time, the Biden administration has been outspoken up to a point uh, twice in the same week, denying uh, reports in the Washington yeah. Post, no less, that uh, uh, there were no allies that uh, gave credibility to Justin Trudeau's version, but also addressing the issue of saying we are talking to the Indian government about this. I'd say that uh, I don't think uh, uh, the government in New Delhi cares really about Justin Trudeau, uh, but they certainly do care about what the White House has to say. Althea? I was really surprised this week that not a single MP in question period asked a question about India. How 
weird is that? We spent the entire spring talking about foreign interference with China and not a single MP had any questions about the government's response to this, whether it was too much, asking for more information, using question period to question the government. Like, how weird is that, that not a single member of parliament asked any questions about this? Okay. I gotta leave it there. We're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, more at issue. We'll break down a major reversal from the Ontario government. I made a promise to you that I wouldn't touch the green belt. I broke that promise. And for that, I'm very, very sorry. Will there be political consequences for Premier Ford's decision to change course? That's next. After mounting political pressure on the resignation of two cabinet ministers, the Ontario government announced a major reversal. It was a mistake to open the green belt. I'll be reversing the changes we made and won't make any changes to the green belt in the future. It's been nearly two months since a bombshell finding from the province's Auditor General that a plan to swap protected land for homes had been rushed and favoured certain developers, yet only now has Premier Ford apologised. I am very very sorry. So what changed and can he recover from this scandal? Chantal, Andrew and Althea are back. Uh, Chantal, I'm going to start with you. I mean, when you're watching this at home or, or you're watching it in the office the way I did, I, I was. How, why did this take so long for him to realize that this had cost his government too much in terms of cabinet ministers of political capital and that this was the only way forward through this? Well, it's not the first time as a government uh, and that we see a government uh, believing that it can ride through a storm and, and yeah. believing that it can tough it out and that the summer will make it go yeah. away. Yeah. And when the fall comes, uh, <laughs> as the leaves fall, the story <laughs> will fall uh, from the radar. Uh, but basically, there was blood in the water. Uh, the stories that, that hurt governments are stories that continue to have legs day after day after day. Mm -hmm. And this is a case where journalism uh, yes. made the story poison for the government. So yeah. blood in the water, two bodies thrown overboard. Uh, and I'm guessing now a hope on the part of Premier Ford that um, as he rose away from this blood in the water, it won't follow him anymore. Andrew, and, and what do you think is the likelihood of that? <laughs> Well, it's always good to see the government apologize for its quote-unquote mistakes. That's better than not doing so, and obviously sure. it's the smarter political move. But there's mistakes and then there's mistakes. And, <laughs> you know, in this case, the mistake was not just that it was terrible policy, unnecessary to, 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 in any kind of housing rationale, uh, but it, that they promised they wouldn't. And it's not just that they broke the promise, but that they did so in the most corrupt possible way. So what exactly are you apologizing for? I'm sorry I'm corrupt. I'm sorry I'm untrustworthy. At some point, people are going to say, "I'm sorry, we elected you premier." Mm -hmm. uh, so, and sorry, you know, sorry is what you say when you drop something. You know, I'm sorry I broke your lamp. Uh, uh, in this case, these are this is really serious stuff, and it, it looks just like he's sorry he got caught. He's sorry that he's tanking in the polls, and I'm not sure people are going to be terribly persuaded by the sincerity of this of his contrition at this point. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not just that he broke the promise, um, which I think was central to the, the sorry part, but I, it, it's also, Al Althea, that, that there was the, these connections between government and developers. I, I, I think that's the, that's the problem that Andrew's talking about there, the bigger problem. Well, I mean, that is actually what led to the alleged, uh, you know, the accusations of cronyism and yeah. corruption, yeah. Uh, because it looks like the Ford government actually favored a handful of developers, two especially, um, and gave them a sweetheart deal, uh, tipped them off that this was going to happen. And those individuals stood to make billions of dollars. And, you know, what's interesting is today um, Premier Ford was asked, well, you know, <laughs> What will this mean for the developers? Because obviously they are going to try to recoup the money that they've lost yeah, because now yeah. the land that they're sitting on is really not worth all the money they thought it was worth. Um, and he said, well, oh, I don't can't predict what the developers are going to do. Well, you know, so part of, so this story is not over yet because yeah, yeah. the taxpayers, you know, should not be on the hook for uh, the Ford government's decision to rush this process and to like nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Not sure what exactly happened in the back room, but a lot of people know more than I do um, and in a process that wasn't kosher. Um, 
So it, it, it is kind of like the gift that keeps on giving for the opposition. I really do think that they did not expect the pushback that was going to no, happen clearly, on this issue. Clearly, yeah. I think they thought that they might get uh, a bit of pushback in some writings where, you know, that are close to the green belt and yeah. feel this connection to the land there, but not the fact that all these allegations would slowly yeah. emerge and that yeah. their cabinet is not just two cabinet ministers, you know, more than that have been. Yeah. Uh, sacrificed if you count staff as well, yeah, yeah. Um, where you know people's stories kept changing, and the RCMP is now looking into it. Like it, it it's yeah. not over yet. Chantal, yeah, it's it looked today like the, it was protect the premier's back mm -hmm. uh, yeah. time, and that basically tells you that the government uh, by now has run out of of ways to wiggle out of this without uh, doing what we saw today. I agree with the others. I don't think the story has necessarily played itself out. Yeah. It, it shows you, uh, yet again, how uh, when you've been in government for a while, you can almost literally get cut off from reality. Uh, to have believed inside that bubble that this would all just blow over. Yeah. You know, politics is so much about loyalty and being on the team and, and you know, being supportive. And at some point, people can become so supportive that they just, they just stop being in contact with what's actually happening. Yeah, stop raising red flags and saying this actually isn't a good idea or this isn't something we should go ahead with or why don't we reverse course. I wonder to Althea and just very quickly how much the housing crisis itself or how much they thought the housing crisis could be cover for the decision in some way. Uh, if they thought that, I think that's a stupid thought for lack of a better <laughs> word. Uh, or maybe it was just uh, my stupid it, thought. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. this is a story that yeah. people at Tim Hortons can get behind. You know, he gave the uh, his friends land that's you know yeah. that's worth something now and other people uh, didn't make money and it looks yeah. like you know he was he he gave a sweetheart deal to his friends yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a very easy story for people to understand and that's sure. why it's hurting them last last word to you Chantal two things I was raised in Ontario and the green belt means something to me I don't live I've never lived mm. next to it so the notion that you would do this having promised not to touch it uh, and no one would notice or say anything is kind of mind-boggling uh, and then it does remind the Quebecer that I am now of stuff I used to hear about the Montreal City Hall and sweet mm. deals in Laval yeah. And, yeah. and those are not pretty stories and the people who got caught in them are been long gone from office or public life. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thanks everybody. Oh, we'll send things back to Adrian now in Toronto. Thanks Rosie. Coming up, a Syrian family has been reunited here in Canada. <laughs> the homecoming of a family torn apart by war. That's up next. So this is the Karsoff family, family's first family photo in more than six years. That's how long they've been apart from their son, Adnan. So Adnan is now 11 years old. He was only five when the war in Syria separated him from his family. He came to Saskatoon with his grandmother waiting to be reunited with his family. And their moment finally is our moment tonight. <laughs> <laughs> We're very happy and excited that he made it safe. We couldn't believe ourselves, you know, we were worried until last minute we saw them. So because of the situation that uh, started in Syria in 2011, my family was separated. My rest of the family, my dad and uh, my brother's family had to flee to Turkey. It was very hard. He was around five years uh, old when they were separated. He grew up with out of them, you know, like uh, all these years. He missed them every day. We've been waiting for years, for ages, for this day to come. What was that like for you? Exciting. Yeah? Yeah, I tried to not cry, but I couldn't hold it. Yeah, you're not the only one having a hard time not crying. So thanks to Bonnie Allen for getting that for us. Um, you know, so it was all these years because they were in Turkey, there were delays in immigration status, the pandemic, all sorts of logistical issues. But finally, he met his little sister for the first time. For all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe 
to the Nationals' YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.